welcome everyone. we'd love to to welcome our distributor community to our webinar on your buyers are changing how can you keep up i am michelle richardson of the brooks group and i'm going to introduce my co-presenters here in just a moment as we have folks joining the zoom i'd like to cover off just a couple of housekeeping items uh, first of all, this webinar will be recorded and it will be emailed to anyone who registered um, or attended today. So look for that to come through your email boxes later today. And second, we want to hear from you. Uh, we have a large group attending and we know that you all have perspectives to share. So please feel free to add comments or questions either to the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we do have some time at the end um, allocated for questions. However, uh, we will also try to work some of those in um, as we go. We are so excited today to, um, to share our insights on buyer trends for uh, distributors. And so let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to kick this off by introducing my esteemed co-panelist, John Nance is founding partner of Redwood Advisors. And John, I'm gonna give you just a second to, to tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely, and we'll talk a little bit more about Redwood in a second, everybody, but we do a lot of strategic planning, commercial excellence work for distributors. I see I've got some, some former clients and colleagues uh, on the phone, so it's good to, good to see some familiar faces in the, in the participant list. We'll talk a bit more about what we do, but one of our, uh, focus areas is distribution. So really excited to be having this conversation with everybody today. Thanks, John, and excited to dig into this even some more. And my esteemed colleague here at the Brooks Group, Lee Richards, uh, our group vice president of sales, and fresh off of some speaking at, a, um, at an industrial conference. So we're excited to have Lee. Lee, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Great, thank you for having me today. Uh, as Group Vice President of Sales, I work with manufacturers, distributors, and other types of channel partners improve their commercial excellence. I work with these organizations to help them with their sales skills, their sales strategy, their sales structure so that they can build sustainable sales models for success over time. And as you mentioned, I've just spent the last week here in Orlando with the Industrial Supply Association. And, you know, what I'm hearing here with manufacturers reps with distributors with their manufacturers as they start building 2023 plans you know the theme is very similar to what we're hearing here today you know technology the changes in the customer's environment changes in our economy are really going to have an impact on the way that we sell and the way that we support customers in the year to come so i'm happy to be here thank you michelle Absolutely. And as I mentioned, I am Michelle Richardson. I am the Vice President of Sales Performance Research here at the Brooks Group. And uh, I have been working with clients uh, in sales and sales effectiveness uh, for more than 25 years, uh, 15 of which here at the Brooks Group. Uh, in my role, I do industry research. I work with clients on a consulting basis. Uh, do skill diagnostics, uh, share industry insights, and work on talent strategy. And as Lee said, and John both, we are excited to share our expertise, uh, what we're seeing in the world of B2B selling um, and distribution with you. A little bit about the Brooks Group, what Lee and I represent here. Um, we are an award-winning business-to-business sales enablement provider. We're focused on bringing practical, straightforward solutions for both sales talent and training and effectiveness challenges. We've been in business for more than 45 years. We work with a variety of industries, but we have a special focus and expertise on distribution and manufacturing, and that's hard goods, capital equipment, consumables as well, but we do understand um, that unique area. And again, excited to be here. And I am going to ask John to share a little bit about Redwood. Absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. So obviously a lot of team here on the page, but I'll just give you the high level overview. Started my career at McKinsey, focus a lot on distributors. Like I said, I've got some former uh, clients actually on the Zoom. So good to, see, good to see you guys and other former colleagues and friends. Um, we basically do strategy and commercial excellence work sales transformations, organizational designs, territory design, 
inside versus outside versus e-com, those types of topics, digital transformation type things specific to uh, distributors. So great to see so many familiar faces and really excited to be having this conversation with you guys. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Why don't you tell us a little bit about our agenda for today? Great. So everybody, we have, we have a lot to cover a lot of really good um, things that we want to share with you. And we want to be sharing both qualitative kind of insights and also some really interesting hard facts. So you're going to walk away with like a, a, a much better understanding of what's going on out there with respect to buyers of distribution. So we want to, what we've done is we've um, identified five key buyer trends. So when you sort of look like Lee was saying um, at the outset, when you kind of step back, how are buyers changing? The buyers who um, are coming to us to solve their problems and get their goods, et cetera. What's important? What's sort of salient about that? So we're going to walk you through these five key trends. We're also going to take for each of those trends, what's an implication? And each organization, you know, everyone's on their own journey. You may say, hey, we're already on top of that implication. Or for some, some of you may say, hey, you know what? We actually haven't thought about that. Regardless, we're going to have some really interesting facts and anecdotes to kind of make this stuff come alive so we all walk away with a better understanding of what's going on. The last thing that we want to do with you all is one thing that's been really interesting is, is this digital transformation that Lee mentioned at the outset. And I know everyone in the industry has been talking about this for, for a decade now. We are very much moving along with that. And so we've come up with a very simple kind of diagnostic that we actually want to do. We want to have a practical exercise we could do as part of this conversation. So we're going to actually help you guys um, get everyone on the phone to do a quick diagnostic of your um, organization. Where are you in the distribution journey? We're going to do a poll as well so we can kind of see where we are as a, as a community and a group. Um, and then we'll, we'll close with some Q and A. So that's the plan. Uh, that's the plan for today. Great. Great. I'm excited for this um, diagnostic. I think that's going to be a really interesting takeaway for folks. And as we are getting ready to dig into these trends, I'd like to remind you again as well, feel free to send us your comments. Tell us what you're seeing from your perspective, as well as your questions, submit those through the chat or the Q and A. And now let's talk oh, about trends. Great. So there are five really big trends and we're gonna unpack each of these. So don't worry, this, we're gonna we're gonna get into a lot more detail than what you have here. But when we think about what we're seeing, both the Brooks Group and Redwood with our clients, what are these key things that we're seeing? The first is, and I, I bet I'm gonna get a lot of head nodding here, there's a lot more online buying. And I've actually got some former clients on the Zoom that I know we've worked with you on these topics. So I know from direct experience that we've worked on this together. But the percentage of sales that are moving from the traditional into e-commerce is really massive. And the role that digital marketing is playing is really changing. And I think we've moved from a world where we were talking about it to a world where, really, where, where we are really seeing it. What are the implications of that? And we want to talk about that. The second one is time scarcity. And I think we can all identify with that. We've got, everyone's got their phones now, you know, people do not have as much time uh, available. And so the, 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 con the consequence of that implication of that is when clients give you time, we have to be on point. We can't just kind of walk in and have conversation. We got to be on point. So that's number two, three order transparency. We got to get it to them quickly, but also where is it? Four easy buying experience. In the age of Amazon, in the age of a lot of these digital tools, people's expectations about how easy is it for me to buy, even if I'm filling out a paper form, is it easy, right? And that's becoming a table stakes issue. And the last thing is just personalization. Um, people are starting to take for granted that the experience that they have with you, your staff, your emails that you send them, the website experience they have, it's like, hey, is, it, is this just the thing you show everybody or is this actually personalized to me? And we're going to talk about some really interesting things we're seeing specific to distributors on personalization. So I'll kick it over to Lee to start us off on more online buying. Yeah, let's spend a minute talking about, no surprise, online buying. I mean, it's in our lives. You think about what's happened over the last few years with COVID. We have all experienced this, this transformation of online buying. Three or four years ago, you could run into somebody that would say, I don't know that I want to trust buying online, my credit card and this, that, the other risk of buying online. But today it's just commonplace, isn't it? And what we're finding is that this consumerism that we experience day to day in our lives, we're bringing to work with us. We're bringing this expectation of buying things more transactionally online in the easier environment that we can. 
when we look at some of the research from some of the top uh, research organizations like McKinsey and others, you know, they're telling us that one third of buyers today in the business to business environment prefer a fully digital buying experience. And when you think about this fully digital buying experience, it starts with how do I find new vendors? How do I find new products? How do I qualify these products? All the way through the transaction itself. And it's not just small products. It's not just commodities. It's not consumables. We're seeing it with large product products as well. I was with an audience this past week, and I'm hearing more and more of $500,000, $600,000 products being bought online, just like you might buy a book or groceries or something else. That transaction is taking place at a much higher dollar value. Well, we can thank Amazon, right? We can thank Amazon, we can thank Walmart, we can thank all of this consumerism that we've become so comfortable with. We ask ourselves, you know, if I can buy groceries online and have it delivered to my home tomorrow, why can't I buy my widgets? Why can't I buy my toner cartridges? Why can't I buy my drill bits or whatever I may be needing? As consumers, we are being driven towards this idea of let's go e-commerce, let's go online. And so we asked a question, how do we keep up, right? As distributors, how do you continue to evolve your business to satisfy those consumer expectations? Well, there's a lot of great e-commerce platforms out there that you could implement, whether you build it in-house, build it into your own website. Those are great solutions. There's a lot of great third-party storefronts out there as well. Look, your customers really don't care about the technology behind your e-commerce solution. What they're looking for is make the transaction simple. I want to buy when I want to buy. I mean, after all, so many of us are working from home now. How many of your transactions now might occur after hours? This is what our customers are looking for. And when you can build that e-commerce solution, you're satisfying so many more customers than you were before. Secondly, I would say, take a look at your traditional sales roles. Just because we're talking about e-commerce, I do not believe that the role of an outside salesperson, customer service, or any of this human-to-human, face-to-face interactions in sales is going to go away. What I think is going to happen is the behaviors and the skills of these salespeople, I think it's going to continue to evolve. And so I ask the question, how do you take those traditional sales roles and give them superpowers? When I say superpowers... Think about those insights. If we were to use this technology of tracking a customer's interactions on our websites, you know, a customer comes in, they look at some collateral, they download a white paper, they watch a video, they come back a second time or third time. If I'm an outside sales rep and I've got that data available to me, how much more powerful can my sales call be? And then thirdly, let's look at this role that marketing has. You know, we always say, right, sales is a team sport. I love saying that, right? It takes a lot of people to put together a successful commercial strategy. And I think today, marketing becomes so much more important for the role of sales. I think marketing really sets up sales for success. And what I like about marketing capabilities today with this technology that's available, we can cast a wider net. You know, historically, we were limited to a geography, to a territory, but really the the internet is unlimited, isn't it? There are no boundaries today. And so we can cast this wider net. And what I'm seeing as a trend in these conversations I've had this last week with many different manufacturers, reps, and distributors is there's more transactions coming in from customers they've never spoken to before. Now, they may be on the West Coast. They may be on the East Coast. They're going to be further away. But there's people that they're touching that they've never had the opportunity to touch in the past. And all of this is being enabled by the development innovations of technology. Let's take a look at this second trend that we've got occurring in our business place. Time scarcity. Don't you wish we could invent time machines? You know, time is one of those resources that is that is just a challenge for both buyers and sellers. And as we look at the role of salespeople calling on customers, we find that our sales calls get shorter and shorter in length. 
you know, pre-COVID, it was probably nothing for you to go see a good customer and get an hour of their time. Today, even those good customers, you're probably struggling to get an hour of their time. It's probably down to 30 minutes. And when you're looking at those 30 minutes that you have with a customer, you have to make sure that you're making the best. You're getting the highest ROI on that time that you can. I look at it like calories. You know, you talk about calories, our health and, you know, what we eat, what we consume. There are good calories and there's a bad calorie. Well, I look at the same vein when we go into a sales call. There are good uses of a, of a sales call minutes and there are bad uses of sales call minutes. Let's make sure that we're using every minute to the highest potential that we can. So let's look at some of these best practices of how you can keep up with this limited time you're getting in front of customers. You know, again, provide your sales team with the data that they need so that they can walk into a sales call empowered with information. We want to make sure that when we arrive at that sales call, that we know as much about that customer as possible. The trends that we're seeing today say customers don't want to answer questions like, how long have you been in business? How long have you been with the company? Those are those wasted calories. Let's come in with insights, understanding what it is that the customer is looking for. Let's make sure that we're focused on the data and we're personalizing the sales call to what it is that customers are looking for. And when you can do this, not only can you accelerate a sales call quickly, but you can also disqualify those sales calls that don't add value and might waste your time. I learned early in my career, win fast, lose fast. But when we've got these data insights, you may find that this sales call just isn't worth it. It's not a top priority for us. And sometimes that's as much of a win as winning the deal. We look at asking good questions. You know, some of the insights that we're seeing from customers today is teach me, demonstrate to me that you know our business and that you know different ways to solve my problems. You see a lot of things out in the marketplace. Ask me questions that are thought provoking. Ask me questions that challenge the solutions I've always worked with. Ask me questions that help me open my mind to new ways of running my business. Demonstrate that you can truly have an impact on our business. And then thirdly, what we see is come with some clear recommendations in mind. Again, you've got 30 minutes with this customer. When you come to them, stick to what that subject is. And if you've done your research, you've done your discovery very well, you'll be able to arrive with that customer with some, you know, maybe two or three solu solutions that you might think will be good for them and then stick to that. Find a way to solve that problem that you're there to solve for right then and there. This is not the time to feature dump. It's not the time to talk about the history of your company. Let's stick to the customer's needs. Right, Michelle, let's look at the third one. This third trend is order transparency. When we're talking about order transparency, we're talking about that point from after they've clicked the buy button to the point that they receive the product or the service in their hands. Now look, the bar has been raised here pretty high. Again, I'm gonna blame consumerism. You know, this transparency of getting a product is driven by some of our commercial suppliers where we see, you know, order status all the way through. You know how today I can order a pizza online and I know when this pizza is in the oven. I know when it's out for delivery. I know when it's gonna be at my doorstep. I like that. And you know, in the business to business world, a lot of customers would like that too, but it gets complicated. When we look at these implications to what that means, we got to look at what's happening in our distribution model. You may have a lot of moving pieces to get the product from the manufacturer site into the hands of the customers. I see a lot of organizations that are working with a manufacturer's rep that's sold the product. You've got a distributor that has to deliver the product. You've got a manufacturer who has to build the product and they have their own supply chain issues, don't they? We need to make sure that all of us are working together in concert and we're making sure that each party knows what's happening through the delivery cycle. Secondly, this fast turnaround. You know, if I can right now buy toner cartridge, uh, buy a new toner cartridge online, it's very possible I could have it here in my office by five o'clock today. 
that expectation is very high. Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to bump up your inventory levels, but there are ways that you can improve the speed of delivery many, many, in, in many other fashions, whether it's just-in-time inventory, whether it's staged, uh, staged warehousing, whether it's putting warehousing in key locations, customers are expecting fulfillment very quickly. And thirdly is, well, stuff happens, right? I, I mean, every now and then the ball gets dropped and it just doesn't go as well as planned. Customer expectations are high. And when it's time to recover those dropped balls, transparency is really the best way to approach it. When you have to have that difficult conversation with a customer that says, well, I'm sorry, but we're going to be a little bit late. It's going to come, but we're not going to meet your expectation. I want you to keep three elements in mind of sharing that information. Number one, accept the fact. Accept the fact that a delivery is going to be missed. Do not worry with the customer who dropped the ball. You, know, you often hear customers don't want to know how the sausage is made. They just want their sausage. They don't care who dropped the ball but let's just accept the fact the ball got dropped. Secondly, let's acknowledge the customer's frustration. It's natural to be upset. And, and I often refer to say, you know, I'd be upset in that situation too. I, I understand the pain. And then thirdly, commit to satisfaction. You don't need to tell them how you're gonna fix the solution. They might ask, you might respond, but don't necessarily lead with, this is what I'm going to do. Lead with, I'm gonna take care of things. I'm going to take ownership and I'm going to make sure that this gets resolved as quickly as possible. And if you can keep those three elements in line in, in mind, I think you're going to have a great customer experience. Lee, I just have to comment on the, the transparency issue because it's something that we've heard quite a bit in working with our clients, um, especially recently with supply chain delays and um, price increases and that kind of thing. It's often hard for salespeople to feel comfortable having these kind of courageous conversations um, with their clients, but it is so important and can help keep that trust uh, intact. We did some research um, a couple of years ago with pro spe specifically with procurement um, and 72% of the procurement folks that we surveyed said they were actually likely to pay a higher price uh, to work with a vendor that sold and negotiated with transparency. So it is critically important um, even then and still is now um, to make sure that you know, your organization is being transparent and that your, your customer facing teams are comfortable having those conversations. Absolutely. All right, let's turn it over to John. Let's talk about those last two trends. Yeah, thank you. So the last two trends, everyone, is um, easy buying experience. Um, buyers today want a simple, straightforward buying experience from both researching the products to receiving their order from that full process. If we don't mind going to the next slide. So let's talk a little about this. And I wanna point everyone to the bottom of the, the, bottom of the page because we have some really interesting insights about that. 94% um, of B2B buyers report that an omni-channel model is more effective. 60% say they, could, they have higher spend when multiple channels are available. I think we can all imagine this. It's like, hey, if I can call someone, if I can text you, if I can do stuff like that. And 49% of distribution customers rank value add services in the top three differentiators for distributors. McKinsey did this really, really rigorous report and they found that uh, value add is really, really important. So easy buying is really important. So we want, the first thing is we need to make your purchase process easy and consistent across all your sales channels. So online, in-person phone. One thing that we find is it's really important to have consistency across those so that they look kind of similar. And the second thing is that we wanna make your purchase process online, in-person, on the phone, simple for your sales team and buyers. Next uh, next slide. And to the next slide, we're gonna talk about that last buyer trend, uh, which is real personalization. Hey guys, thanks. Um, on personalization, um, 
Buyers are looking for high quality, personalized recommendations aligned with their business and previous purchases. So shall we go to the next slide? Yep. So again, I wanna point everyone to the, the key insights at the bottom of the page. 75% um, of B2B leaders say they personalize most content and communication with their buyers. So the point is this is becoming more and more common. And 86% of buyers, this is B2B in particular, want sellers to use customer data to put their needs first meaning we're giving you our data, use the data to give me some personalized recommendations. So how do you keep up? Um, and we're gonna, this is actually a good segue into the thing we're gonna do next, which is the, uh, the kind of diagnostic we're gonna run you all through here in a moment. Um, first, and there's kind of four key steps to this um, that we've seen in our, in our clients. The first is we have to collect and store key customer data. And it, it, when our clients, when I think about through the products that we've done in this space, this is kind of like, this is where you have to start. In a lot of instances, it's like, we, we have the data running through our systems, but we're not collecting it. We're not, maybe we have a transaction log, but it's not by customer. So we have to collect and store the data. That's the first thing. The second thing is you have to be able to analyze it. And so this is sort of the second challenge. I've got the data, but they can actually analyze the data. And I'm sure a lot of folks on the phone who've, who've been involved in products like this know that actually is really complicated. I have all the data, but then what do I do with it? The third thing is you have to make smart predictions about what are your customers might buy next. So I've, I've analyzed the data and then I actually to get a, to Lee's point, I have to get a specific recommendation for a customer about here's what you want. And then the last one, which is funny, a lot of people overlook this, is you have to think through when are you going to present it. So I know what you want to buy, but when do you actually reveal that to the customer? Is it do you have a way of letting your outside or inside salesperson know, hey, this type of customer tends to buy these things and this customer hasn't bought two of them? Or is it through a email, a really personalized email going out, letting people know um, that, hey, you might be really interested in this piece of capital equipment or you might be interested in this consumable because you bought this equipment and we know that it consumes this. So we should, but you're not buying it yet. Is it through the email? Really thinking through the presentation of that. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we're going to do, everyone, because this is sort of a, before we jump into the, to the open Q&A, we want to actually just do a live activity with everyone. Um, so what we're going to, what we're going to do is, um, I know obviously we've got a, people from a variety of different organizations here, um, but we're going to have you kind of assess yourself on a scale of zero to four. We're actually going to open up a poll and see where you all think you are. Obviously we'll keep this confidential. But just, just to kind of give you a second to kind of assess. And so Michelle's going to walk us through. We're going to go point by point, And we'd love everyone to fill out the poll as we go. I think we're going to open the poll in a second um, about how this works. So the first one, collecting data. And we actually have in the poll, if people don't mind uh, trying to fill that out. Does your organization effectively collect and organize customer data, spin, geography, products, purchase, segment? We got five votes in. So we'll see where this, this sort of goes. We'll give this one second. We've already got 15 votes. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. Okay, yep. great. Right I'm gonna end the poll. Let's see what we got here. So sharing the results. It looks like 65% uh, are at the basic data collected and stored. So they're at the two level there, John. Got you. Yeah. Got you. And then a third, it looks like a little less than a third have in-depth data. Um, yes. one question I'd have, and we're going to move on to the next part, but if, if people want to chat, I'm curious for the folks who filled out with the basic data and that's the majority, um, do you see any, like, what do you see is missing when you look at your data? What, what makes you say it's basic versus in-depth? I'm kind of curious if anyone wants to share, is there things that you're like, Hey, you know what? We should be collecting this, but we don't. So we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, uh, throwing your thoughts in the chat, let's go to the next, uh, next one. Yes. So the next one, going back to the four, four step framework we, we were laid out before, analyzing the data. So, so you've got the data. Um, do you analyze it to collect insights? Um, we have no analysis, semi-regular and then kind of consistent in depth analysis. That might look like you've got a Tableau report or you've got um, a kind of a consistent, it could be Excel, but it's something you generate monthly or quarterly to kind of see what's going on using the data you have. And let's just see uh, where, where, where we get here. 
looks like semi regular so far is maybe leading the leading the pack. Yeah. Just another minute. And I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And so 67% are analyzing their data on a semi regular basis. 11% um, consistently and 22% no analysis. Yep, got you. Okay, let's move on everyone. We're getting, this is great. This is, we're kind of getting a sense of, and hopefully this is helpful for you all to kind of see where everyone else at is as well. Um, it's one thing to, to have a report, but you actually have your peers kind of filling a live poll out. So I think this is pretty credible uh, data here. Um, third thing is making smart recommendations. And let's open up this poll. So you've got some data, you've analyzed it. Now, are you converting that um, into recommendations for your customers? Um, options being no recommendations, some loosely based, and then potentially some pretty rigorous recommendations based on analysis of the customer data. Yeah, and as we're kind of watching some of uh, some of these polls come in, John, kind of going back to the the collection of the data, it looks like people are loosely they're they're collecting some basic data, but maybe missing some of the specific problems that that customers are trying to solve, um, or not able to extract what they need um, for for use. Yep, absolutely. And I saw that uh, question from uh, the comment from Cindy, actually, Cindy, and I really, really like your point, which is Cindy made this comment of we are missing what specific problems they are looking to solve. And what I will tell you is really interesting, having worked on some products that are related to this, is one thing you want to be able to do is you'll look at the data, see what people are purchasing, and then actually start saying, okay, this customer falls in this segment. Here's the stuff that this segment's buying. This particular customer is buying this and this, but they're not buying these other two or three things that customers like them tend to buy. This is what Amazon does, right? When they give you the personalized recommendation, yeah. this is exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And I have some clients that have done a really great job of segmenting and then figuring out because sometimes customers, they're not going to tell you what they're going to want. You have to almost figure it out with the data and you can do it. It's, it is doable. So let's look at the results. Um, Again, we're kind of a lot of weight. This is actually really interesting because Michelle, it looks like on this in this case, most folks are doing recommendations. We actually have a few where there's there's none, totally you no, know, nothing wrong with that. That's just kind of where you are. It's just a diagnostic. But everyone's kind of recommendations loosely based on the data. I will tell you, and Lee, I thought that it made yeah. this point at the beginning. If you really, one thing that we're starting to see is if you get your data systems really in place, imagine giving your inside sales rep, your outside sales rep, a very simple, like simple report saying, hey, this is what this customer is probably most likely to buy, right? Based on what they're buying and not buying. And, and imagine just to please point about time scarcity, the power of I'm walking in and the company's told me, hey, this is what I think I can sell. Um, really makes your salespeople much more effective than just relying on their their sort of practical knowledge, which is which is really helpful too. But you want the the combo. Let's do the last one, we'll, and then we'll close out this this exercise. All right. So last one, team, and thanks everyone for filling this out. This is actually really interesting data. Um, how do you share them? So um, once you have these recommendations, how would you assess your organization's ability to kind of get them to the customer at the right time? And let's just take a look. Um, some we share ad hoc, which is sort of like, we just kind of do it, when it you know, whenever. We have a semi-consistent recommendation strategy. Maybe it's your, your e-commerce market, marketing, or it's these like little heads up to your inside or outside guys before they walk in the room, like, hey, you should pitch this product or you should mention this because, right, they haven't bought this even though we think they should based on other things they're purchasing. Um, let's just take a look. So we got 14 votes. Give it one more second. All right, so it looks like we're at 43%, yeah, with the, with the ad hoc recommendations. Yes. And I would just say, everyone, this to me, this makes sense because this actually is the of the four we're seeing sort of the people we're, we're sort of on that sort of transformation journey. 
This is the one that's made the least amount of progress. Like 43% are basically saying we're doing recommendations ad hoc. That totally makes sense. There's nothing wrong with that. That's exactly what I would expect because this is the last thing that can happen. If you don't do the previous three things, there's nothing to present. So it makes sense that this is where we're seeing the least amount of progress with the, with the group. What I would say is this though, and I, I don't always like to be the bearer of bad news, but this is where the value gets created. Because one, two, and three take money. They take resource, they take investment. But at the end of the day, to Lee's point, it's all about serving a customer. And if we're not getting them that recommendation, so I always tell clients, we got to look across all four. And if we get to a B minus answer, we get an A plus outcome. But if we just have amazing data and amazing reports and we're all, we're tracking customer sales and we know what's going on and it's not changing how we're interacting with customers, then we're not really creating a ton of value. Um, so I would say this is one that I think people overlook. And I think it's really important to think through, even if it's very rudimentary to say, hey, how do we use the data we have to equip our sales teams or our marketing teams or even our customers themselves to give them really good recommendations? Because they are, going back to the time scarcity point, they're actually open to recommendations now because they're like, you tell me what the answer is. So it's both a challenge, but also an opportunity. Um, but you have, it's, it's easier, easier said than done. Yeah, and I think there's a question there, I think that comes to me, John and, and Lee, which is how well are your teams equipped to be able to deliver that message, right? So there's getting that data to your teams, to your sellers and, and have them be able to present but how well equipped are they to take that data, interpret it, and have a meaningful conversation with customers? So it's you know there's a there's a data aspect of it or a um, an infrastructure aspect of it, and then there's a skill set aspect of it as well. Absolutely. So Michelle, maybe we go to Q and A, guys. We've got about uh, we've got some time. Yeah. And so I would just say we've got some great questions in the, we've got some really good questions uh, that, that have been running. I've been, I've been trying to try to type in as well. Yes. Just, there's some interesting one here. Yes, I'll throw one out. So um, Tina asked this question. I know John, you um, answered it in the chat, but I'd love to get a discussion going. Do you think that the traditional kind of people person sales reps need training for the online virtual buying and selling environment? What do you think? I'd love Lee's answer that I can offer a another same. Person. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny. You know, it's ironic. I posed this exact same question to my audience this morning here at the conference. And what we're seeing is the transformation of the role of outside sales or customer service. We don't think that this role is ever going to go away. There's still a responsibility for somebody to take a customer's need right? You hear what their opportunity or the problem is and connect it to a solution. I think what technology does is it speeds the, it, it adds speed to the way that you get to that solution. I think it also improves the quality of that solution. Um, so do your salespeople need training? Yes, I think so. I, and you know, it's not just a traditional sales skills. I think that's very important of asking good discovery questions and probing very well, but there's also a little bit of data analytics in there, isn't it? You know, it's about sifting through this data because to John, your point, that last element of those recommendations, I look at that and say, that's the hard part. You know, as a salesperson, I need to go dig through that data and then say, how do I use that data to make a recommendation? You know, it's not as easy as the old, would you like fries with that? It's right. what flavor fries, do you want salt with that? Do you want them extra crispy? <laughs> you know, we've got different flavors now. It's complicated. So I do believe that there's a little bit of a data analytics, data analytical skills that salespeople need to start developing. And one of the things that we're seeing with salespeople coming out of college today or this younger generation, they've grown up with technology. You know, those of us that have been in sales for, for you know, as long as I have, we're having to learn those new, those new muscles, train those muscles. Um, but yes, we're seeing those who are successful have the skills around analyzing the data. Totally. What I would say, so I, I think that's that's dead on. And I think the other thing that we're seeing with our clients is as we move into e-com and as, and as digital marketing becomes more important, like thinking through how the each of your channels will work independently and then together becomes really important. 
So like, for example, in the technology world, you'll typically see you've got marketing and then sales and then marketing will sometimes get a marketing qualified lead and then we'll kick it over to sales. This is a very classic motion we've seen in technology for 30 years. There are very few distributors that are doing that today, but there is a ton of value that can be created. So to Lee's point, not only is it about getting the salespeople, it's also about getting the systems in place to make your technology investments, make your sales teams much more effective. And again, I always tell people, we don't want the most complex solution here. It's going to take us three years. And yeah, it sounds amazing in theory, but I just, I'm old enough now to know that that's not the right approach. We got to figure out how do we get something simple that works? And so I always tell people, hey, you've got your digital marketing, you've got your e-commerce. Is there a way we've got access to some databases? Can we figure out, hey, wow, we just had a potentially huge account buy $20,000 of stuff on our website. Now, they may, that might not be our top 100 customer but it's a massive potential customer. Do we have the systems in place to be able to tease that out and kick that over to our sales team, right? And that is critically, critically important. And so I would say, Cindy, to your question, not only is it about training the sales teams, I think it's about really figuring out your internal systems and processes to make sure that all these channels are working together. Um, and that, that, can be, that can be very hard to do. As anyone who's trying to get distributor salespeople to use CRMs know, it's very hard to get these sales guys to write down their data in, into the CRM because it's kind of their own confidential proprietary data. But again, the marketing team can't help if they don't have access to what's in your head, right? And so anyways, this, this stuff gets really complicated, but um, there's a ton of opportunity for improvement. Thanks, guys. Great answers. Um, so question from Kurt. Uh, do you think sales reps need to be trained on how to present the data? Uh, level level one, level two, level three, that is a Brooks Group term. Um, buyers are all motivated by other different things. Perhaps our sellers are not trained to present at a higher at higher levels for value add. So level one would be those strategic um, senior level decision makers, C-suite, that sort of thing. Level two would be um, mid-level management, vice presidents, uh, that kind of thing. They're looking at implementation. And then level three is mostly your individual contributors. Um, and they're really looking at, you know, how do I keep my job easy, maintain status quo, that sort of thing. So that's kind of Kurt's frame of reference. But thoughts on that from you all on, on whether they need to be trained on how to present the data in addition to, um, you know, what we've already talked about so far. Yeah, if I could, let, let me share a thought. Customers don't buy products. They buy what the products do for them. Customers buy outcomes. And when you think of that level one, those executives, the outcome that executives are looking for them from a product is very different than those who are at the ground level, the field level, the implementation level, right? These executives are looking for, how is this gonna grow my business, help my business? They're looking at how, how it's gonna help the organization versus the folks down at the ground level, how's it gonna help me make my job? How's it gonna make my job easier? Am I gonna meet my KPIs? It's about me. I don't think that the data changes the way that you present your solution. I think what the data does is it brings you to that solution and that expected outcome much more quickly. It gives you a little bit more accuracy with what customers are looking for. I don't know that customers need the detail behind how you got to that solution and, and different industries are gonna be very different there. But from my experience in the industrial space, messaging still belong that messaging is still important with the outcomes that you're going to provide that particular buying influence the data is just going to help me get there faster what would you say john would you agree with that any yeah. thoughts i don't know i really like i mean this is this is obviously he's using your guys framework so i i i i, I agree with what you said yeah michelle how about from a from a behavioral perspective as well understanding you know the way that people want to be sold to, the way they want to buy. Correct, correct, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. There's the, you know, how do you communicate on, on the outcomes the customer is looking for, but then also how do you communicate in a way that builds trust and rapport uh, with, the, uh, with your customer, with your buyer? And a lot of that is, is behavioral. Is it, um, do you have a results-oriented buyer? Do you have a relational buyer? Um, and understanding how your sellers are wired, right? Their behaviors, their motivators, and being able to pick up on that from your customers. When you combine that with the information on where they are in the organization and their motivations, 
um, then I think you're you're looking at gold uh, in terms of being able to connect. Yeah. So n another question that's come through, and um, John, I'm going to throw this one to you first. Do you think this approach that we've been talking about has evolved for um, high product mix or when orders are um, highly variable? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I don't know if I would, I don't know if I would, I, I don't know if I can definitively answer that. I think this is one of those, unfortunately, one of those ones where it depends, Mark. And, you know, I'd almost want to almost need to know a little bit, a little bit more. Um, but maybe Michelle, if you don't mind, I might, I was just reading through the, the Q and A and there was another yeah. comment that kind of made me somewhat think about this, Bob, Bob Jordan, um, and Bob, good to, good to see you on the, on the call made this point about outside sales should be dedicated to finding new business um, mm -hmm. and not as much maintaining accounts and maintaining accounts can be done versus inside sales. And I just want to say, I thought th this is a, that's a really interesting conversation. I kind of think relates to, to some of the stuff that we've been seeing as well. And as more and more customers have been going online with the e-commerce and with digital marketing being helpful, we have found, I don't think there's been a project where we've done this work before uh, where we have not found that as you think through the implications of e-commerce and you think through the implications of digital marketing, that there's not a pretty important change that needs to be made in terms of your sales organization. And it's not always what people think. Um, in some instances, we found that it actually makes sense to actually grow as you get more intelligence from your digital marketing solutions and you've got pretty high volume uh, inside sales reps that can just make a lot of calls. Hey, if someone's paid $14,000, like let's give them a call, right? I mean, let's see if there's something there. In the old world, we would never have done it because they would have never made the $14,000 purchase. But for some reason they did. And then they might tell us they don't, they're they unhappy with their other distributor. And then ultimately that becomes an account that might go to an, an OSR. Um, and then conversely to Bob, to your point, you know, some of these really stable accounts where there's not a lot of complexity, do you move that down to an inside sales rep supported by e -com, supported by digital marketing, where they're still kind of getting some of that personalization. They don't necessarily need that on, on site, on present uh, sales reps. So anyways, I just wanted to say, this has been a very interesting topic for the work that we've been doing the last few years in thinking through how do the commercial organization change as all these trends we've talked about today, and now that they're coming to fruition, I will say that we, we have yet to have a project where the sales and marketing organizations don't really change as you think about the next one, two, and three years from a staffing and organizational design perspective. Yeah, I would agree, um, John, on that, because we've seen some very similar um, situations as well. And a lot of our research, especially kind of coming out of COVID, we were seeing organizations indicating that they were going to restructure. They were going to invest more in inside sales or more in outside sales. And I think that's a, um, an important conversation, an important thought for uh, sales organizations. It also has implications for the types of people that they hire. Um, you know, we do a lot of talent strategy work and assessment work, and it requires different competencies. If you've got folks that are more inside sales or account management, account development oriented versus new, new business development or outside sales, you know, regardless of how you kind of slice that, um, it does have implications not only for, you know, the structure, but also the types of talent um, that you hire for. Michelle, can we uh, speak to Kurt's question around technical products moving closer to online purchase. Um, I mean, I, I kind of see a theme. Some of my recent conversations, people asking me about, you know, high spec products. Are we really going to sell high spec products online? Mm -hmm. And and I like to address this in two ways. What do you mean by selling online? Because when we look at high spec products let's take the transaction out of the the equation. When you have a high spec product, whether it's material, feeds and speeds, whatever that spec may be, customers are spending a lot of time differentiating one vendor from another, one product from another, doing that online research. And you may get a high return, not by so much having that transaction online, but having the data available having the modeling available, having the resources available so that they can narrow it down to one or two vendors that I wanna have that final conversation with. So there's one element of taking your product online for that evaluation uh, purposes. 
But I'll also share a story uh, where I was working with a robotic arm. Think about robotic arms doing assembly and such. A manufacturer recently, they have actually taken a high spec product and put it onto a marketplace. Now, if you think about robotic arms, you know, they're specced with how much weight, how much speed, you know, what type of options they have. But they took this approach to say, we're going to put a standard model online. And it, the cost of this, the standard based model, was around $800,000. Now, they never sold one online, at least in the six months that I knew about. But what it did do is it generated conversation. Because they were on the marketplace, they received messages, phone calls, and said, well, I like what you've got online, but instead of blue, can I get it in red? Can I get redundancy in the switch? Can I get something that can lift more weight? Can I get something that moves faster? It was a conversation generator more than anything else that led to new opportunities. So I say that to say, get creative. Don't, don't put yourself in that box to say online sales means I've got to transact like Amazon and the others. Online commerce can mean a lot of different things. When you think about your customer's buy process, map your customer's buy process from that trigger event that says, I need change. Is this a problem? Where do they go to find information to say, do I need change? If you're in the pump business, right? You get customers that say, I got a funny vibration. I'm hearing a funny noise. Is that a problem? That starts the buy process right there. And you can take that element and put it online as a starting place. Okay. Great, great. Thank you, Lee. Michelle, I'm always wondering if we grabbed this question from Sherry. She just she just put it in and I really yes. liked it. She was yes. she was asking about um data collection and analytics seems to apply to commodity tangible goods and perhaps high volume. What implications are there for selling more intangible products such as service? So this is really interesting. And I've and I just wanted to say I've seen this kind of play out in a few different ways. And I, and I think it depends on, um, obviously the devil is in the details on this, right? But let me, I'll, but I'll tell you some examples from distributors that, that, that I've worked with. Um, one thing that we found, interestingly enough, kind of Sherry, directly building on your point, is that sometimes you, as you start to learn more about the outcomes that people are trying to solve, um, you'll start to learn, hey, if they're buying this thing, right? There might be a service that they actually need to support it. They might need someone to come check uh, to repair it. They might need someone to fix it, like break fix type stuff. They might need someone to check it for regulatory reasons to make sure it's working properly. Like, like you know, your, your fire alarm systems have to be looked at every certain number of years. So one thing you can start to do is if there are those value add services, that can be very, very profitable lines of business to say, okay, here are the things that we're selling. And is there something, a service that we can actually sell on top of that and using the data of here's who's bought those items. And if you can build out the capability to deliver the, the value add service, then, then going after it. And I think I see distribution very much moving in this direction, by the way, moving away from just selling stuff and actually delivering solutions and solutions combine stuff and services. And that's how, you know, Amazon business is going to have a hard time with that. If you're just selling stuff, you know, a lot of with what I find the, so many distributors, just the knowledge that they have about their market, it's not just the stuff. And so figure out how do you, how do you insulate yourself by literally using that knowledge is by getting someone into the service game, if that makes sense for your business. And it does depend on the product category you're in. Um, the other thing is just on services. A lot of times you can kind of run the same analysis. So, you know, let's say someone is um, saying, hey, look, I, I, I want a value add service. I want you to be doing some productivity analysis or something on my equipment machine. Um, and then you might say, hey, do you want us to help you on your consumable optimization? Right. We have a service on that and we can actually help you figure out what input stock you should be using because we're the ones who have access to all the pricing. Right. You're just telling us what to buy, but actually give us responsibility and we'll actually sell you um, the solution. So. Anyways, just by way of saying, I, I think that the services, it's, it's different, but it, it can actually be very, very rich. Um, and I think data has as, as big a role to play there as it does in your more traditional kind of good types type area. Thanks, John. All right. Um, it looks like we have uh, one, another, one more question in here. Um, this one is more on the technology. So with email blasting software out there, 
um, how do we prevent from uh, getting blocked and, and placed in spam? So I guess this is really more of a marketing type question, but John, thoughts on that? Yeah, and I know we've got Bob, I think I've even had conversation with Bob Jordan about this, who's, who's been typing in some great questions here on, at MDM. Um, look, it actually goes back to something that we've talked about, about personalization. Um, email statistics are really simple. Did they look at it? Did they click on it? Did they click on the link? What's your open rate? And, and all of those are inversely correlated to putting you in the spam folder. How do you get someone to, and it, it's very simple. It's very intuitive. It's like, do they actually want to look at what you've shown them? And so quite frankly, I think the number one trick is it's got to be personalized. If you're just saying, hey, here's our, here's our annual catalog. Look at our 10,000 things. We've got to, right? It has nothing to do with me. You're just pushing your agenda, right? But if you've taken a little bit of time to know a bit about who I am and what you're telling me is at least somewhat personalized, right? It doesn't have to be like dead on the money, right? But at least some attempt is made in your system to not send the same email to everybody. There's some type of logic around customer segmentation or what they bought or something. Say, hey, look, we've got this new product that people like you are interested in. And here's a little bit of an overview, right? I, I generally find when I look at the data for, for our clients where we're looking at this type of thing, that that really goes a long way. So, you know, I would just say if you're, if you're having problems with that, you just need to take a hard look and say, well, what are we sending out, right? Because if it's high quality stuff, people, will, people won't put you in the spam folder. Um, but it's, it is easier said than done. John, if I could add, add to that, you know, there's, there's two elements. One is the technology. I mean, you got to get an IT guy to, the IT person to really filter through some of the technical aspects of it. But once you get through that, it's about that messaging. I want to tag on to that messaging. Ask yourself, this message, this personalization, are you writing a message about you or are you writing a message about them? Because nobody's interested in listening to you, the salesperson. They want to hear about them, the buyer, and the, the opportunities they have to grow their business and to approve, improve their situation. That's number one. Number two, read that message and ask yourself, would you open that? Would you read it? Would you respond to that person with that message? Put it in that mindset of, would you respond to this email if this was sent to you? And nine times out of 10, you're going to sit there and rewrite it. That's my experience. I do that anyway. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Lee. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's There's the technical aspect of it, but there's also the messaging aspect of it as well. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that we are coming to the end of our time and we've we've pretty much covered uh, the questions that have come in through Q&A. Gentlemen, any, any final parting words before we wrap up? Just thanks to everyone for being on the conversation. This was great. The, the Q&A conversation was really dynamic. The chat conversation was really dynamic. I was enjoying reading along and uh, we just really appreciate your time. And it's uh, good to see some friendly faces and some new faces as well. Looking forward to being in touch with, with the folks who joined us today. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I, again, thanks for everybody that's dialed in. And, and I would leave you with, don't try to do all of this overnight. This is a journey. This is a marathon. Take small bites. In each incremental step that you make is going to be one step better than you were yesterday. So look at this on a on a long horizon. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's not going to finish overnight. Take your time. Well said to both of you and thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have enjoyed this robust discussion. Um, look for that follow-up email with the recording. Please feel free to reach out to any of us if we can be of service. Thank you.